Now, tomorrow we will be celebrating the International Day for Rural Women. And to mark this day, we will have a discussion with the European Union and its partners who jointly work under the program known as EU for Women. This EU-funded program supports government in improving rural livelihoods with a focus on supporting smallholder farmers in terms of productivity, income and employment opportunities. Our talk today will mainly zoom into the situation of rural women in Zambia. As we all know, women are central to agriculture. They are key actors in the areas of nutrition and food security as a whole. In many countries, including Zambia, they make up almost half of the agricultural labor force, but their production remains hampered as they have limited access to inputs, to extension services, to land ownership, to finance. This in addition to social and cultural barriers. This is an interactive program and uh, in case you'd want to contribute or ask questions, you can call us up on uh, 0770-347-221. Our WhatsApp uh, line for texts and voice notes is 0970-324-843. To discuss these issues, we have with us today the following EU partners. We have uh, Joyce Smunza. Joyce works as advisor for the EU-funded Enterprise Zambia project. She is the Gender and Nutrition Specialist. Joyce, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Right. We also have uh, Katia Goetz. Katia is the social gender expert working for the Zambia Agriculture Value Chain Loan Facility provided by the European Investment Bank. Katia, welcome. She is uh, joining us uh, uh, on our uh, WhatsApp platform. How are you today, Katia? Good morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Right. We also have uh, Ramakala Banda. Ramakala works as advisor for the EU-funded AWARE project. She has been in the water sector for 10 years, implementing WASH and now water resources management projects. Ramakala, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good morning. And last but not the least, we have Mutande Costa Tembo. Mutande is Assistant uh, Business Development Manager at AfriSeed that works with uh, rural women in agriculture through its seed outgrower scheme. Mutande, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Right. To begin with, I'll start with uh, Katia. As part of your project, you've developed um, a gender analysis in the agriculture sector of Zambia. Could you tell us what the main uh, conclusions were for this analysis? Sure, thank you very much. So maybe just to provide you with a little bit of context to the results of the study. So the gender analysis has been conducted in early 2021 at the start of the project. So the EAB and EU funded um, agricultural value chain facility aims at strengthening access to finance for the agricultural sector and also aims at better integrating smallholders, particularly women, into agricultural value chains. And to really actually guide us on how we should approach this, the gender analysis has been conducted. So we have first of all seen that climate change is already affecting the agricultural sector in Zambia strongly. Um, but Zambia is obviously a vast country, so you also have various agroecological zones and so the impact differs slightly from zone to zone. Yet in the past years, droughts have led to serious impacts on food security, poverty and economy. We've also found that um, the value chain integration of smallholder farmers is very low to date and this is due or this is caused by a number of challenges. So overall, I think the productivity is very low at present. So, in essence, yields are not competitive and the biggest obstacle for increasing yields of smallholders are the lack of mechanization, irrigation and inputs. So, you're probably well aware that most of the work in the fields is done manually and most of the farmers rely on rain-fed agriculture. Mm -hmm. But farmers also lack access to information and knowledge, so access to knowledge um, actually in this regard means they are not aware of the prices that are being paid at the various markets throughout Zambia, or they also are not aware of latest agricultural practices, or they are not aware of any new equipment that will help them to increase their productivity. Um, so all of this information 
businesses that they are very um, difficult to be found in um, Zambia, at least in the very rural areas, let me put it like this. Uh, and the third finding relates to a lack of organization. So uh, organization is important for small uh, farmers. Uh, you know that most of them farm on less than two hectares, and so they only produce very small surpluses. Uh, and for example, it's difficult to supply to the larger ma markets in Lusaka or Andula because they require higher volumes. So organization would be essential to not a, only be able to supply higher quantities, but to also have, for example, higher bargaining powers when negotiating with off-takers. And cooperatives can be very useful in this regard, and those are also um, have also been growing in the past couple of years in Zambia, but they suffer severe external and internal challenges. And external challenges would relate to infrastructure. So of course, you know, um, Zambia is huge, as I said, and a good um, road system would be needed, but also, you know, um, storage facilities or cooling facilities would be um, required. And the internal challenges really relate to poor internal um, governance. Mm -hmm. And we also found that many small farmers have limited access to markets, so they rather transact on the spot. You know, Long-term offtake agreements, um, and then, in essence, they don't have access to structured value chains. And lastly, um, as was I think already also mentioned, access to finance remains a challenge. So many smallholders do not have access to formal financial services. That has to do with um, limited accessibility. So most of the ba the banks um, have their branches in this urban or semi-urban area, but farmers also do not know. Um, what exactly is the services or what are and they also perceive that the terms and conditions that are being offered by banks are not favorable to them so these i think are the main findings and we also found that for all of those challenges women are much more affected than men mm -hmm. that has to do with their dual tasks you know at the at the professional or at the farming house uh, level and also at the household level. So they also have to take care of the family, they have to make sure that their families are feed or fed well, so um, they have less time for farming and they also have very less uh, decision-making authority. Uh, I stop here because I'm sure we have more time to go into the details later on or throughout the program. Right. Thanks, Kathy, for that uh, information, Dr. Katia, for that information that you've given us. We will get back to you. Um, let me now um, turn to you, Roma Kala. Um, AWARE supports the sustainable use of uh, water resources. Now, with your experience, what major barriers have you seen for women in your project? And how does the project support women? Um, thank you very much. Um, Yes, so Accelerate Water and Agricultural Resources Efficiency Project funded by the EU and BMZ um, supports um, smallholder farmers in southern and central provinces of Zambia. Okay. Um, as the name suggests, mm -hmm. we work with smallholder farmers and in the area of water, um, managing water resources efficiently. Um, coming to the barriers that particularly women smallholder farmers face, um, one has already been mentioned by my colleague Katya, um, access to finance is um, a major one. Mm -hmm. uh, as you may um, understand, um, in order to use water efficiently, you are talking about uh, um, access to some investment mm -hmm. in terms of drip um, irrigation especially, um, and use of uh, solar panels as pumping uh, mechanisms and um, things in of that nature and mm -hmm. they require uh, investment. Mm -hmm. um, the other barrier would have to do with uh, um, the social cultural norms that might be prevailing. We work in a sector, water sector, where it's male dominated mm -hmm. um, at various levels, um, including uh, at the grassroots level or farmer level, where you might um, find that women um, are more pronounced or more visible when it comes to domestic water use, but the productive use of um, the water resources a bit um, on the low. And really, 
uh, what the project is trying to, to do or what it has done the past um, three years or so is to train farmers in financial literacy. Mm -hmm. We deliver modules through the Ministry of um, Agriculture and our other partners uh, at the district level. Um, this exposes our smallholder farmers to possible financing that is available to them and uh, that is innovative and suited to, to, um, to their needs. In terms of um, water efficient use, um, our smallholder farmers are able through these um, financing mechanisms, whether um, savings groups or small loans, um, to access um, irrigation equipment um, and uh, things of, of that nature to support them to use water more efficiently, but mm -hmm. to participate in horticulture, uh, in dairy farming, um, so that they not only use water domestic level, mm -hmm. but also um, uh, use it in a productive manner to to improve their income, um, yeah. Okay. Basically, th that's what the project um, does. Great. Thank you. Right. Um, I turn to you, Joy. Um, Enterprise Zambia is a challenge fund that provides grants to agribusinesses that have the potential to integrate smallholder farmers into farm-to-fork value chains. Where does the project stand, and how does it support women? Thank you very much. First, let me begin by saying that. Um, as uh, Enterprise Zambia, what we did was uh, to do a gender learning audit mm -hmm. to the, the companies that were in CO1 and CO2 okay. so that um, uh, we can understand uh, what face they are doing, if they are supporting any women mm -hmm. in, the, in the various companies that we are supporting. And so <coughs> what we did was that we um, wanted to make sure that um, the funds that we are giving to them uh, positioned well to support women and so what we do as a camp as a enterprise Zambia is that um, we want to encourage all companies that are in um, that receive their grants mm -hmm. um, to prioritize support to women and at the same time also companies need to show that they are putting in place deliberate effort to support women okay. so as um, that is where we stand as the Enterprise Zambia. And then um, after that, we established that um, we had about 40 to 65% uh, women participating in, in uh, these uh, uh, grantees. Okay. And so um, how do we now support these women? Mm -hmm. What we are doing is that um, the project is supporting women by encouraging all companies to prioritize um, uh, the, the, the work that women are doing. Uh, that's the first thing that we, um, we did. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, women are trained in agricultural practices. Um, also, they are um, supported in inputs as well as access to markets. Uh, and um, we've seen also that uh, some of the women are improving. So basically, that's where we stand and that is how we are supporting these women through the, uh, the companies that are getting grantees. Okay. Now, Mutande, your seed company is at the source of the food value chain. How do you perceive gender disparities through the company's daily activities? Okay. Thank you. I'll start by um, saying that uh, what we do as a seed company. Mm -hmm. So Afro Seed is a Zambian old seed company that produces markets and uh, distributes different seed of cereals and legumes and also crop protection and maturing products. Okay. So currently our business model is centered around smallholder farmers and currently we're working with 1,335% of which are women. Wow. And with the aid and partnerships of the EU and Enterprise Zambia Challenge Fund, we're looking to increase that percentage to at least 60%. So how we perceive these different gender disparities in our daily activities is, for example, in our legume value chain. Mm -hmm. Most of the production in the legume value chain is dominated by women. However, when it comes to the marketing and sales of the product, there are very few women involved, and most of these activities are carried out by the men. Additionally, women are not always uh, have limited access to finance, as my other colleagues have alluded to, mm -hmm. so they're not always able to afford the larger seed packs. So right. as Afri Seed, we have introduced smaller seed packs to ensure that even our women with limited access can still 
have access to um, smaller <coughs> seed packs of legumes that will increase the household nutrition as well. Okay. So now um, we turn to cultural norms. I know Ramakala, you had earlier mentioned that it's one of the challenges, the cultural norms that affect women when it comes to um, agriculture. So I'll, I'll th now turn to you, Katya. Um, it often seems that uh, women farmers are relegated to unpaid farm work and household tasks, while men receive uh, training, resources, and land. How is the situation in Zambia? Yes, thank you. So I would assume that I would think that this statement is generally also applicable um, to Zambia. So when we look at training or know-how, many women complain that the training is not targeted to their needs. So in terms of content, first of all. So it often does not touch upon the work that the women are mostly doing. So for example, weeding. And then the training does not cover what ex what equipment is existing that would help them to simplify their work. Mm -hmm. Or women also complain that the training is actually too basic. So that as women grow, they also need further um, insights. They want more knowledge provided. And most importantly, I think also um, the trainings so or the extension service provision meetings just simply don't take place when women have time. So those meetings are, take usually place early in the morning when women are busy, you know, yeah, um, looking after the household, right. bringing the kids to the school, mm -hmm. um, cooking the food. So they just don't have time. Sure. And I think at the same time, um, there's very limited female extension staff so that would that actually those women could then also relate to and could all openly um, open up to basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think connected to the limited training opportunities um, that uh, is that women also actually face major problems to add value to their produce. So that could be you know just processing the mangoes that they are harvested that they have harvested uh, into juice or just drying them and selling them at a higher price because you have um, added value to it. Yeah? So uh, women tend to have also lower level of knowledge in terms of packaging. Right. So uh, they are unaware of labeling or barcodes mm -hmm. and that tends to indicate that their products um, look of lower quality and they will then also receive a lower price. Um, and I think when we, for example, go back to the issue of resources, um, Yes, women tend to own much less um, land than men do, but I think also this issue also goes um, beyond the issue of access to land. It also, you know, cro cuts across the value chain. So, for example, they also have less access to storage facilities. So that forces them to sell their produce right after harvest. And they cannot benefit from off-season sales. So when there's less supply and higher demand so they could materialize higher prices and when um, women use or when women store they tend to do that at home in their own rooms and that would then result in higher levels of post harvest um, losses okay. and i think also here linked to to that is a, another major barrier to the commercialization of female farming is the limited access to transport and market information so particularly women then, as I said before, they, you know, are on a spot basis. So they tend to sell their produce locally because they also cannot travel the entire t day to um, go to the to higher or to larger markets given the numerous um, household tasks. Mm -hmm. So they sell locally and rely on farm gate prices and the spot markets that would uh, obviously also often mean uh, lower prices. Mm -hmm. And then, Joy, um, you work with many agribusinesses that hire women farmers. Do you see women breaking their cultural norms, or do you see little progress in the field? Uh, well, I would say um, progress is being made, <coughs> though very slow, in the sense that um, these uh, women, they are still operating in the communities mm -hmm. where they have set social standards. Um, that finds it very easy to support their uh, their men <coughs> in 
in these business transactions. And at the same time, as uh, my colleague mentioned at the beginning, we have these gender roles that makes it very difficult for these women to uh, to have more time than the than the males. So you find that in terms of uh, production, they they lag behind the they lag behind the men, and also um, we have uh, <coughs> also the, the in terms of decision making. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's easy for it's not very easy for women to make independent decisions. True. If you ask them to say, um, "Are you able to access this yeah. at a household level?" They will say yes. But in, when it comes to control, you know, it's it is difficult for them mm -hmm. in the sense that they have to get permission from their husbands to do anything that they want to do. And uh, personally, I think I want to say that uh, we also need to look at. Uh, uh, the counseling that are being done on people they are getting into marriage because this action has made it very difficult for some of the women to be tagged, you know, certain names in the community. So basically the, it's very slow but we are moving, f uh, we, we are progressing. So in yeah. short, women must also have um, the opportunity to make decisions. Yes, right. that's very important. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Ramakala, how can women overcome these cultural norms that keep uh, sidelining them in a sector where they make up almost half of the labor force? How can they have a more powerful voice? Yeah, um, thank you. I will pick up from um, what um, my colleague has already alluded to. I think um, I I'll mention two things. One is on the part of the women themselves, mm -hmm. and the other is on the part of um, we uh, organizations like ourselves and government implementing agencies, what we can do to empower them. What we have learned in southern province is that um, um, when women take up leadership positions, uh, for instance, we have what we call catchment protection measures, where um, the communities are basically harvesting water, constructing check dams, it mm -hmm. sounds uh, technical already, yes, yes. and we have um, worked with our uh, district partners to encourage women to take up leadership roles. Here, it's supervision of the works, understanding what is technically going on and, and what uh, the works entail. We have noticed that we have grown from the first site, we have grown um, the number of women supervisors from 10, 20 uh, percent to 40 50 and 60. Right now we're operating at 60 and 50 um, percent. What that has done is that uh, it has demonstrated and um, women's ability to lead uh, right in the uh, rural areas. Mm. Um, it has also strengthened the discussions that need to be had uh, at that level, transformative discussions where um, there was resistance but the fact that it is happening, it offered an opportunity for people to see, oh, women can actually do it. And they are present now at the decision-making um, table, at least to that extent. Mm -hmm. We have um, water user associations mm -hmm. where they also serve, apart from supervising the works. Okay. So uh, to step up, um, but also in, in stepping up to have also the male colleagues at community level, mm -hmm. the, the leadership as, um, as partners, not necessarily that women should um, uh, seek uh, permission or negotiate f with a higher um, power or power dynamic, but basically to demonstrate and women, uh, men to come on board and support these initiatives because okay. it has a lot of um, advantages. Okay. Uh, the understanding of community dynamics, mm -hmm. um, the leadership <coughs> skills are really, really amazing. And, and in these sites, we have seen change. Okay. Lastly, on the part of... Um, implementing partners like ourselves and go uh, government institutions. Yeah. I think there's need to approach um, these communities um, when we are empowering them with all sorts of, um, of interventions um, to, to approach it uh, with a, a, the, the common phrases, rights-based approach, where we should understand that uh, the women, the smallholder farmers, are really right holders and they in, in that space, they need to be empowered to know what is going on, to be given a voice, but also to demand some of these services, mm. to know that they, they have a space and they could demand. Okay. Well, um, for those of us that save, also we can be uh, empowered or approach um, our intervention in such a way that we can be accountable to the right holders. Okay. Yes, thank you. So now um, let's talk about climate change. 
Um, this is something that we can't run away from, and a lot of things are going wrong because of climate change, certain and or because of what we are doing. And um, um, I'll turn to you, Katia. Climate change is uh, also affected farmers. It's making farming harder, especially for smallholder farmers. But then it's hitting women harder than men. If yes, why is it the case? <laughs> yes, indeed. I think it is hitting uh, women much harder than men. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's fairly sure, yeah, that the varying climate affects women more than men. Partly because also, as I said before, I think women have less livelihood options Mm -hmm. and they carry responsibility for family nutrition and food security. So you would, for example, also see that most of uh, or many more women than men grow staple crops such as um, cassava or maize um, to make sure that they have um, sufficient food for the family and they are not so much involved in, in cash crops which would have them to yeah generate additional income mm-hmm. and at the same time men I think can also choose to migrate to other areas so they can leave agriculture at all um, and then that might also mean that the agricultural and the household tasks uh, remain with women so in, in this regard really to support women to better you know cope with climate change knowledge and information um, is key and as we already um, stressed, I think um, women farmers have less or tend to have lower educational level or none at all, actually. And that obviously prevents them from obtaining information on climate change and possible adaptation or mitigation um, methods. And I think what is also to be borne in mind, um, actually, women are also more likely to, you know, having to cope with the burden of increased labor um, when there have been, you know, climate uh, related shocks or mm-hmm. severe weather events um, that will then also re- I think I've uh, lost the connection there. Um, I'll turn to you, uh, Makala. What's your take? Um, yeah. Thank you. I'll pick it right up from what Katya was um, um, alluding to. I think basically because in the rural area, um, livelihoods really are so connected to to nature and natural resources. Um, Talk about a source of heating, water, the soils on which people farm, uh, all these are affected by climate change. And women tend to be closest to the livelihood activities um, that depend on, on natural resources. Um, I, I am biased towards uh, water mm-hmm. in the sector where we, where we work and agriculture depends um, on that. Um, so basically that is why they are hit, hit um, the hardest. However, in, in the grand scheme of things, we find that the women are also um, not at the same level as their male counterparts in terms of their capacity to cope mm-hmm. because you can adapt and have access to resources that will help you um, basically overcome some of these uh, challenges okay. so they are hit um, the hardest because of their lower capacity to, to basically um, cope with, with the impacts of uh, climate change. Okay, so um, let's listen to Modi Mabwe a farmer who is supported by AWARE and who testifies on the limited access to water. Mubawe aba baga tuyiha mburi mbuguli mwa. Titwaji yuguli mama gardeni aga mbubawe ya baga tuyiha tulaji waguli mama tulaji waguli mama gardeni sunundu rumu na lubala. Tula weza wizi wia kububika umilaini ute kwa ilumwe ala utanjiri maningi mwe yangu yesu. Uli bobo, tutubawe ya inji, ibaka tuia kubajitingi ale, ale kodi nini. Wita ale kodi inti tujita abuzu wa abuzu wa mukadini. In a way, into a lot of guy, a gambo tit waji, pay. Bawe, a gambo bawe, a bat wall, a good to quail here. 
Sunu to Alima wind and put to Ali William Marion Right, that was uh, Modi Mawe, a farmer, a woman farmer actually, who was supported by AWARE, testifying there on the limited access to water. Uh, Katia, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Right. So in the gender analysis you've shared, just mentioned that uh, CSA, that is Climate Smart Agriculture Adoption, is low and gendered. Could you explain first what uh, CSA is and uh, secondly, what do you mean when you say CSA is gendered? Sure, I'm happy to do so. So basically the concept of CSA, Climate Smart Agriculture, is based on three pillars. So the first one is relating to sustainable increase of agricultural productivity and income. And um, the second one is uh, built on adapting and building resilience to climate change. And the third one then is reducing or re removing greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So a specific practice is considered as climate smart agriculture if it enhances food security alongside um, one of the other two objectives. So it is either adapting and building resilience to climate change or it is reducing or removing greenhouse gases. And what I find is, is interesting is that the concept itself is still fairly new. Most of the CSA practices have already been existing for a very long um, time. Obviously, there is a large variety of CSA practices and technology technologies that would then have to be you know, grouped along their entry points in terms of soil or crop water management and also the integration of forestry and turning to your second question so um yeah in addition to to um climate change i think also um there's a strong gender dimension in csa practices so there is little research that is um, concerning csa practices and the adoption of um those practices by females, but indicators that are existing um, are saying that CSA is mainly adapted by married men in Zambia. So female household has also practiced CSA, um, but this is then very often due to the work that has been done by NGOs or government programs. And we can actually also re uh, explain those results. And the um, adoption of CSA by women farmers is hindered by several factors. So we had, I think we've already discussed quite a bit on knowledge and um, information. So in a nutshell, women are just not aware of um, the methods, um, but they also are not the decision takers on the farm level. So it's men that take the decisions on um, what to grow, and it also um, they also decide on you know new agricultural techniques. So they are, the men are the and the decision makers, but it's actually most of the women that are then implementing those decisions. Those decisions. Um, and yeah, as we know, land tenure and ownership um, of land is much uh, lower among among women smallholders. Um, so they also will find it difficult to access resources like financial resources to um, implement those practices. Okay. Uh, and as a final point, sorry, so women tend to have less productive assets like tools or the use of fertilizer. Uh, and they also have difficulties in engaging male farm uh, labor. And that can actually reduce their ability to, for example, carry out earthworks for water retention. All right. So um, let's talk about access to knowledge and uh, training. Um, I turn to you, Joy. Uh, before I ask you the question, let's hear from Melina Banda, who started farming with your partner, Good Nature Agro, in uh, 2020. Ine dine Melina Banda, nijoke la kukwenje kampu, pii ni wakeo vini pili, na mboli muanga, mtuwenti tuwenti, Chino chaka, 
project ya tu ya mweta panga babanjala tulinu tajoina dimba ndala tinali mambe uzivili tinabweza masaka yokuwa nila sevente ndala mayake inakuwa nila forty seven thousand mfote seven thousand umu tinatenga fifteen thousand tinapeleka ku project ya dimba ina tinagula komalo kwa sefu yokuwa nila twenty hectares Palipano wana ose, tinapapitisa, walukumoku, walu, walu lima. Ii, nandalama, diyo mwe tizasewe nzesa, paulimi watu, wa chino chaka, cha 2022. Motele kuti, gudu necha, yatibwesa chukutukuko cha, cha buino, pano batu, kuno kwa tukukwenje. Motele alimi, nufuna kulimbi kisani, Kuti mkale alimoli mbigila pa ulimo gudu necha. Kuti mpeze mpindu. Komaso, tizisada malamolo ya gudu necha. That was uh, Melinda Banda who started farming with uh, Good Nature Agro in 2020. So Joy, how, how difficult is it for women farmers to get their proper knowledge and training? Does enterprise promote climate smart agricultural practices? Uh, let me start by saying that yes, we do support climate smart agriculture, okay. and um, it's it's difficult uh, in terms of uh, women in the sense that uh, they have got these gender roles that they prioritize, mm -hmm. and at the same time also they have got difficulties in terms of cash. But however, um, what the project has done is that it has anchored itself on the Green Deal, the EU Green Deal. Mm -hmm that support uh, agricultural pra uh, sustainable agricultural practices. Yes. And as a result, um, most of these um, uh, companies that are supporting the small order farmers have uh, involved themselves in training women in the uh, climate smart agriculture. Um, so uh, we are very much involved in the climate uh, smart agriculture activities. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about access to new technologies. Um, Tande, access to modern labor-saving technologies is critical for women farmers to thrive. But how can they get access to such game-changing technologies given the little means that they have? Okay, thank you. Women can get access to the game-changing technologies through networking mm -hmm. and partnering with organizations that are in the same value chain as themselves and what they're interested in. For example, as Africa, it is imperative that our farmers have access to machinery and higher yielding priorities because in that way farmers are able to not only get fetch a higher price for their commodities mm -hmm. but they're also more productive and more efficient right. so if women work together in groups and network not only with organizations such as ourselves but also with government ministries they will be able to access the information and also the knowledge on how they can get access to the game-changing technology that is available in the market okay mm -hmm. just uh, add, let me just add something which i said uh, like uh, Enterprise Zambia, we have uh, different uh, uh, companies that are supporting women. For example, like uh, those that are doing mechanization, they, they, they are also helping women and at the same time uh, uh, creating opportunities for these women to access the new technologies that are coming in. Yeah. Okay. So um, w w let's now talk about access to value chains. Um, let's hear from Constance Nguenya, who is also um, a good nature agro farmer. With her regular sales to GNA, she has been able to build a better house and purchased a Honda. Let's listen to this. Na reja, na mangaranda, na ipula sita no pende. So, chinochaka kana gula muna honda. So, nushitako encourage mwe azima ya anzanga. Kuti, gudu necha ni abu ino. Tie ni na mwe mjoine kuti mpeze mo pende. Very interesting testimony there. Joyce, through Enterprise Zambia, the EU encourages larger agribusinesses to work on a long-term basis with smallholder farmers. How has that worked out for women farmers? It has worked well. Because we've seen the women are assimilating the appropriate knowledge, uh, as as well as um, 
um, appro uh, appropriate knowledge and also forming very strong uh, uh, lead farmers mm -hmm. and um, uh, community champions. I'll give an example from uh, what uh, uh, the lady I've just said from uh, Good Nature. Right. We have another woman who started as a seed grower with, uh, uh, I think, five kgs. Now she has reached uh, 100 kgs. Wow. Last year she made about 3,000 kwacha. Mm. She, uh, this year we expect her to make more than that. She's built a house mm -hmm. and she has also built a shed. Wow, that's encouraging. Yeah. So um, lastly, let's talk about access to finance. Um, Katya, under a minute, in the gender analysis you've shared, it is mentioned that uh, women don't have easy access to banks and rather utilize services ordered, offered by VLSAs or family and friends. How is that evolving? Yes, thank you. So, uh, indeed, I think um, the need for more finance, I think, has been highlighted uh, throughout this uh, conversation. And what we see is really that the market is responding um, to this need. So, you probably have seen that all of the major commercial banks have um, recently launched gender-specific products. Mm -hmm. um, and they're actively moving away from gender-neutral banking to gender-smart banking. So gender smart banking means that, that not that everybody is getting actually the same thing, but rather everybody is getting what they need in order to improve their situation. And for women, this specifically means in terms of banking and finance, um, they value um, being provided with convenient services yeah, that add value. Um, so women, for example, add or value a relational rather than a transactional approach. Yeah? So they are, um, they like to be very much engaged with the financial institution and it might take a little bit longer to actually win them over, um, but they are very loyal um, customers. And I think, um, just to point that out, that um, also in defense of the agricultural um, value chain finance facility for Zambia, the bank on the program, Zanaco, they have recently launched its banking offering. And this is actually offering networking and capacity building opportunities um, so to add value you can also offer those loans on lower collateral terms and at a lower interest rate. So um, they are actually uh, actively moving into gender smart um, banking and we are very much uh, sure that these efforts will pay off because statistically, I mean for Zanaco and um, for all of the other financial institutions as well, so statistically speaking, women are not only the better clients, so they have higher repayment rates mm -hmm. than men, but they are also using more products. Um, so, I mean, there's research that they use up to um, four times more products than men, and they are also they are more they are also more loyal to their banks. Okay. So once they have decided um, to bank with them, so in a nutshell, I think it's it's worth the effort. <laughs> All right, thanks, Katia. Um, Roma Kala. AWARE carried out uh, financial training for smallholder farmers, including female farmers, and you've supported access to small loans to selected farmers. What are the lessons learned? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, out of the 11,000 smallholder farmers that we have uh, trained, 6,000 have been um, females, and uh, out of these, we have at least 294 that have managed to access some uh, form of financing, the, um, the village uh, savings groups that you have alluded to, and some of them uh, from the small um, uh, lending institutions as well. The lesson has been that uh, women smallholder farmers have appreciated financial literacy trainings. Um, our survey showed that up to 96% of the 6,000 which were trained have appreciated the financial literacy training out of all the, um, the modules that we, we offered. Their financial records also and record keeping system have improved, which sets them up um, for borrowing and understanding also of how the financing systems um, work. Uh, we expect that compliance uh, and access will improve uh, in the coming um, uh, few years or farming cycles as it were. Okay. Thank you. Ntande, what's your take? Um, actually, I agree with my colleagues because we have also noticed that women are 
do appreciate um, added financial services. As Afri said, we provide input loans, and we have noticed that a higher percentage of women are more loyal to us because of that, and they are also more prone to not side sell. So because they have limited access to finance, we also give a 50% of our input loans, and this has encouraged more women to be onboarded onto our outgrowth mm -hmm. scheme. We have found that this has been more helpful and more beneficial, and we are yielding the results. Right. Um, Katya, we have to end here. We want to thank you so much for being part of the program. Thank you. It has been a pleasure to be with you. Right. Ladies, thank you so much for coming through to the program. Thank you. Thank you. This has been the International Day of uh, Rural Women program. Remember to celebrate your women in the rural areas, value what they do, they put food on our plates. Let's appreciate them tomorrow being that day, the 15th day of October. My name is Dorita Nangula. Thank you so much for listening.